Today we're going to talk about more than a prayer and more than a song, and uh, we'll end up next week talking about more than a building. Uh, the last couple of days I spent with my family in Branson, Missouri. Uh, you may be a big fan of Branson. We love to get away. We met my mom and my sister and my nephew in Branson just to spend uh, a little bit of time together, and we, we did some fun stuff at rain, and so we found things to do, and then we're leaving Branson. And over on the right, if you've ever been there, they have a celebrity car museum. Anyone ever been to the celebrity car museum? Uh, these are cars that have come from movies. And so as we're driving by, my, my kids see Mater and Lightning McQueen from Cars sitting over on the right. Oh, that's cool. Let's go check it out. And so we go over and look at it. And then I call to see how expensive it was. And uh, it was expensive and too expensive. And so I tell my son, hey, let's just go look at Mater McQueen. That's free. We'll take some pictures and uh, we'll be on our way. And Kate gets upset. And so uh, I try to be a good parent and, and stick to my guns and say, no, we're not, we're not going to do it, but I, okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do it. And so I, uh, I go in, and I find out how much it is, and, and so my daughter and my wife and my son and I, we, we go in, and we're in there for about 30 seconds. My wife and I look at each other, and we're like, what did we just pay for? And so I said, you know, you and, and Kennedy should probably just leave. Kate and I will walk around. And so we're walking around, and Kate's, you know, acting like he's enjoying it, and he's seeing cars. He has no idea, like one of my favorite cars. Uh, was this one from Wayne's World. You can see on Kate's face, he's super excited to, uh, to see this car. And if you don't know Wayne's World, it has this licorice dispenser inside. I was trying to explain it to him. He thought it wasn't very cool. Um, so we walk around, we see the Mo Batmobile and some other cars. And I'm like, isn't this great? And he goes, I gotta be honest, Dad, I'm kind of bored. And I thought, you know what? That's, that's true because for Cademan, he expected so much more. Like, they set him up, didn't they, with, with Lightning McQueen and Mater outside, and like, oh, this is what it's going to get in, and it's a bunch of cars he has no idea about, and he just kind of left empty. Like, it was just kind of like, eh, that was okay. And, and so we left, and I thought, man, isn't that life for us often? Like, you think it's going to be something, and then you experience, and you just kind of feel let down. And you think, oh, I was kind of expecting more. And then the thought is, does that happen to us spiritually? I mean, if we're honest, have you ever got to a point where you're like, yeah, I kind of, I kind of expected, expected more. I expected more from the church. I expected more from religion. I expected more from God. I expected more. Hey, I pray that prayer. I sing those songs. I meet in that building. I expect more from my experiences. And I think the reason we feel like down in it, and anticipate expecting more is because we've kind of missed what our expectation should be. We've kind of set ourselves up, or other people have set us up to experience something, or have set us up to think it's going to be more than it really is. And so I want to look at these three things. I want to look at a very specific prayer. We're going to look at a song, our singing, and then next week we're going to look at this building. What, what does it mean? I mean, we, we think this is church, but, but what does it really mean? to be the church. Uh, would you pray with me as we get started uh, this week? Thanks for your love for us. Thanks for an opportunity to be together. I'm thankful that it doesn't matter who we are or where we've been or what we look like, that we can all enter into this building together and to experience you who love each one of us, who created us all in your image, as different as we all are. Would you help us this morning to experience that at a deep level? Would you help us to reevaluate and to look at who we are and to look at what this really means to follow you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was a 13-year-old kid. You've heard my story, but my parents were going through a divorce. And, and so I had some friends who invited me to a retreat. And uh, I, I wasn't a part of a church. And so they said there's going to be lots of sports. And I love sports, so I said I'm in. They said there's going to be girls. And I liked girls. I was a teenage boy. And so I said I'm in. And there's going to be a ton of food. I'm like, I'm, I'm there. I, doesn't, I don't need anything else. Uh, I'm, I'm there. And so... We go and we play some fun games and, and we pull some pranks. Like I'll never forget uh, one night back then there was messy games. That was a big, big deal in youth ministry. And so all these girls came up and did these shaving cream hairdos. And, and what the girls didn't know is that us guys had shut off their hot water in their cabin. And so they all go back and couldn't figure out how to turn the hot water back on and all took cold showers, which we thought was hilarious, but parents didn't think was very funny uh, when they got back. But I'll never forget that. I'll never forget uh, the games we play, just the experiences I had and the relationships. But I'll also never forget that one night. And if you grew up in church or if you've ever been to summer camp, if you've ever been to any 
thing where you as a teenager went away, there's always that one night. And that one night is this moment where they really pull at you emotionally. Right? They, they play some extra songs and they have what they call an altar call. And, and really the invitation is for kids at this age, uh, students, um, to experience God's forgiveness and to begin to follow him. And so I remember it was uh, that night for me, and I felt this presence of God. And I went down to an altar, and I'll never forget this college guy came, and he prayed with me. Asked me all these questions, and really it came down to me wanting to experience hope and love. Right? But I remember we, we kind of went through this prayer, and I, and I left, and I really didn't think much else about it. For the first time ever, I just felt like there was something out there that knew me and loved me. And so I get back, and it became this big deal. Uh, like this family, it was almost Easter time, and this family bought me a Bible and said, we're so thankful for what you experienced on retreat, and we're so thankful that you're a Christian now. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is cool. And then I started hearing more and more of this idea of being saved, of salvation. And, I, and to be honest, I really didn't know what that meant, but obviously I had experienced it. I didn't, I didn't really know. And so I heard more more about what it meant. I was like, okay, that, that makes sense, and it's good news. And, and if this is new to you, because you may be sitting there thinking, uh, I, I don't know what that means either. Because that's where I was. And so in the very beginning, it's just really quickly, in the very beginning when God created Ad, creates Adam and Eve, everything is perfect. Everything is good. There's no sin. No one's made a mistake. There's no guilt. There's no shame. Everything is good. And there's really only one requirement of Adam and Eve, only one rule, and that's not to eat from a certain tree. And Adam and Eve give in, and they eat from this tree, and immediately they know they've made a mistake. And they feel guilt, and they feel shame. And so they try to work up a way to cover themselves. So they take fig leaves, and they cover themselves, and for the first time they realize they're naked. And really, that's just this picture of realizing for the first time that they have shame and regret. And so they work to cover themselves up. And then there's this, maybe my favorite part in all the Bible, where it says that God basically comes looking for Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve blow it, and God comes looking for them. And so God finds them and, and realizes what they've done, or they've realized what they've done. And then for the first time ever, God intervenes for these people's mistakes. And he kills an animal and he covers them. He covers them. For the first time ever, something else has to die to cover up for the guilt and the shame and the regret and the sin of Adam and Eve. For the first time ever. And then from then on, God is always working to cover our shame, cover our guilt, always providing a way out of our sin ultimately leading to Jesus. It's where Jesus gives up his life to cover you and I, to pay the price. And so the, the thought is, well, each one of us have, have sinned and made mistakes, and, and, and so there's got to be something that covers us. And, and maybe you don't believe that. Maybe you're not to the point where you even believe in God, and that's okay. We're really glad that you're here. But like I've often said is we, we can't even hold up to our own rules. We can't even measure up to what we want to do. And we know that whether you're a Christian or not, we, we fail all the time and we fail to our own standards. And so God back over our sin. And then Jesus comes and he lives this perfect life, the life we should have lived. He dies the death we should have died and he gives up his life on a cross. He dies, he goes into a grave, he's buried and he comes back. Here in just a couple weeks we're going to celebrate this at, at Easter and and, and, and the big deal of this is that God is making a way for us to be connected back to him, to be saved. And so I didn't, I didn't know all of that. All I knew was that somehow I had become saved. And so I, I heard all about it, and then, and then I started hearing these pastors as I started going to church. No matter what church I was in or where I was at, all, all these pastors kind of said this same prayer. And they would say, do, do you want to be saved? Do you understand that you have Sin, do you want to be reconnected to God? Well, well then pray this prayer. And, and the prayer always sounded kind of the same. And so then I started thinking, well, where is this in the Bible? And so I would look through the Bible and I would try and find this prayer. And honestly, I couldn't find it. 
couldn't find it. And, and then I would hear these phrases like, invite Jesus into your heart. And so then I started looking through my Bible, the, the Bible that this uh, family had given me. I started looking through this Bible, and I started thinking, well, where is this? I can't find it. And the reason I couldn't find it is because it's not in there. That there's not this certain prayer. There is no invitation of it accepting Jesus into your heart. And actually, this didn't happen until this mission movement, you know, 1800s, 1900s. They started going and spreading the gospel, and they kind of tried to come up with a way to help people experience God. And so ultimately, not, not, I'm not saying this is bad or, or good, it just almost became this formula. Like, here's the formula. If you realize that you need Jesus, here's the steps. Here's the formula to follow. And so as long as you check the box and have said those words, and then I'm saved. And so it then became about this prayer. And, and honestly, it, it became about walking an aisle, the Billy Graham crusade, and Unbelievable things that Billy Graham did. Lives, millions of lives literally have been changed because of Billy Graham. But we got into this, this idea of walking an aisle, praying at an altar, and praying a certain prayer. And then in the 1970s, kids ministry picked up, and it became really big with children. So if you grew up in church, you spent time in a nursery, and a kids ministry, you probably at some point, someone said, hey, do you want to invite Jesus into your heart? And not that that's bad. We, we try and make it understandable to our, our kids. The kids think really literally. So if you've ever heard a little kid, they really think that there's just this little Jesus who now lives, you know, somewhere about right here. So I don't know what your experience looked like. I don't know if at a certain point you said a certain prayer. And if you did, I'm so thankful you did. There's nothing wrong with it. So please hear me. I'm not saying that the prayer was bad. I'm not even challenging you and saying if you prayed that prayer that you're not saved. I'm not saying that. This is what I'm going to say today. I think there's much more to it. I think there's much more to following Jesus than saying a certain prayer. And we, we want to look at that today because I want to know what Jesus wants of me. If I'm going to call myself a follower of Jesus, I want to know what that means. And so what does Jesus say about this? We're going to look at a couple of scriptures and one really well-known, John 3, 16. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, there should be a Bible around you. And as we get into this, if you are feeling uncomfortable right now, because this is all I've ever known. This is the only way I've ever experienced uh, salvation in a prayer. Just hang with me, okay? Uh, John 3.16, what, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever helps me, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. Uh, I was working on this, and Kennedy uh, saw I was doing the scripture. She goes, oh, I love that scripture. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, let's talk about this. Why do you love this scripture? Uh, I said, because I do too. She goes, well, why do you love it? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, you, you tell me first. And she said, it is a short story of what God has done for us. I was like, that's beautiful. That's, that's right on. That's, that's true. Uh, and I said, well, what, what, what do you think it means? And she said, I think it means I accept Jesus into my heart. Then I experienced that. And I said, okay. Okay, nothing wrong with that. I didn't get on to her. Just nothing wrong with that. But this word believes, let's look, let's look at another one. Uh, John 5, 24 says this, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word, whoever hears the teaching of Jesus, whoever knows the life of Jesus, says whoever hears my word and, again, believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So I think what happened was we, we heard this idea of belief and we thought, well, we, we need to put this into a way where people understand it. And so we kind of came up with a formula for it. Say these words, and when we say these words, then God saves us. But, but 
there's much more to it. Because Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word, and then says these things. Right? He, he says this word, believes. And it's this word, pastuo. Pastuo. And this word means to trust in. To be convinced of. To believe so much that it has an impact of, on every area of your life. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, if you want to be saved, then this is what it looks like. You really trust in what I've said. You really believe in what I'm doing and what I will do. So these early followers, they didn't really know all this. Jesus hadn't died yet. He hadn't been buried. This is what happens. Jesus says, come and follow me. Leave your life, leave whatever you're doing, abandon everything, and come and follow me. And these guys are like, okay, I'll do it. So they leave everything, they abandon everything, and they follow Jesus. And in the midst of all this, they screw up all the time. Even at one point, they're afraid, these waves are beating their bow, and they're afraid, and Jesus kind of wakes up from a nap, and he's like, man, you have little faith. And he calms the waves, and he calms the wind. And the guy's like, who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And they've been walking with him, and they still are like, I don't really, I don't really know who this guy is, is, but there's something to him. And they continue to follow him. And then there's this moment. This is where I want to center in this morning. There's this moment. And I think this is where Jesus really gives an explanation of what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, found in John 8. John 8, 27 through 36. Verse 27, it says this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah Still others, one of the prophets. So they're saying, well, there's all these people from the Old Testament. We just think they've come back. <laughs> and then Jesus says this. Or, and they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Verse 29. And Jesus says this. Well, what about you? It's great what everyone else says, but what about you? Uh, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? I don't want to know who your mom says. I don't want to know about your grandparents. I don't want to even know what the church you attend says about Jesus. Jesus said, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ. Now that carries a ton of weight. Peter is saying, you are the one we've been waiting for. You are the one who will set everything right. You are the one who brings hope and peace and love to every area of my life life. You're the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Verse 31, it says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, the religious people, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Isn't that great? Peter takes Jesus aside and says, no, 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 don't say that. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, disciple, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus does this, verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, there's that word, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Jesus says, look, I'm about to die for the whole world. And Peter's like, no, 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 that can't, that can't happen. And then Jesus says, look, if you're going to follow me, you too will live the same life I've lived. So this is what is happening. Jesus says, look, I'm going to go to a cross, and you too have to take up your cross. 
So this symbol of death, of dying to yourself, you have to pick that up too. That following Jesus is much more than just saying a certain prayer. That's good, and that's okay. But following Jesus means much more than that. Jesus is saying, if you really believe, pray the prayer. That's great. Pray it and believe it. We need to understand that we've sinned and we've been separated by God. We need to know that that God has sent Jesus to die for our sins. Great, but but we should believe it so much that it has this impact on us. That's not just something we say. It's not even just something we think, but it's something we believe, that we're convinced of. And so every area is impacted by it. So if you run a business, it's impacted by this. The way you work, how you parent, the way you are a child, every area of our life is impacted by this belief, how you treat your neighbor, how you love your enemy. Look, Jesus was controversial. We're going to look at that in our, in our next series, Jesus Is. He was controversial. He said things like, love your enemy. So it's more than just praying a prayer. It's actually living out this new lifestyle that God has called us to. The early believers, the early church in the third, fourth century, early on, they believed this. So much so that this is how the church grew and people took notice and not just other Christians. The pagans, those who were called pagans who were away from uh, Christianity, who were not followers of Jesus, they noticed it. There was this emperor named Julian who actually said, look, we're being outdone by those Christians. So he started these charities. He said, look, the Christians, they take care of their poor, but they also take care of our poor. The, those Christians are actually living out the teaching of that guy, Jesus. I don't get it. I don't know if I believe in this Jesus, but there's something different about these Christians. We have to be as good as them. It's because they believed it. Yes, they, they were saved. They, they, they didn't necessarily probably pray a prayer, but they believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of of sins, but there was much more to it. They put it into practice. John 13, 35 says this. How will we know? How will we know if we are a disciple, a learner of Jesus, a follower of Jesus? Jesus says this. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So I, I think it's great if at some point in our lives we've said a prayer. If you haven't, if you're here today and you say, you know what, I, I don't know necessarily about this prayer, but, but I want to believe in this God who, who forgives my sins, great, believe it. That, that's a conversation you have with God and say, God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for me. I believe that, and I want it to impact every area of my life. If you have questions or concerns or anything about that, come, come talk to me. But, but this is what I hear Jesus saying. This is how people will know that you're a follower of Jesus if you love one another. Not, not simply by saying, yeah, I prayed that prayer as a nine-year-old. But, but by the way we love one another. And this love is the same love that's in John 3.16. It's this agape love. It's this self-sacrificing love. Love, not just loving those that are easy to love, not just loving those who agree with us, who are on the same side politically as us, but really loving people. A self sacrificing love. Uh, Greg and the band are going to come back up. So, as the band comes back up, I want you to think about a few things. Yes, I hope you have decided to follow Jesus. If not, maybe today is the day. Maybe today is the day that you would say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to believe that Jesus died for me. You have to decide who you say Jesus is. Not not your parents. Don't just say you're a follower of Jesus because you've grown up in the church. You're a follower of Jesus because you believe that your forgiveness comes because of what Jesus has done, yes. But there's much more. There's much more to it. And that more is giving your life to follow Jesus. 
and being defined by the way you love people. Well, one of the things that we do because of this is we sing. Our response to this love is to sing. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. Uh, would you stand? I want to pray for us, and uh, we're going to sing a couple of songs. God, thanks for your grace. Thanks for your love. Thanks for the, the fact that we can come to you and we can believe, God, that you sent Jesus to die for us. But help us, Lord, not to die. Help us be defined. Help us to believe it so much that it impacts every area of our life. We sing to you now because of great love for us.